Welcome to your daily Google News. Uh, I'm really excited about this. We're, we, we decided to launch a recurring series with all of our strategists. So the people that you see here on the screen, F.A., Ankar, Susmita, Usama, uh, Regina, and Caden's missing. We'll get them back. Um, but these are these are the folks that are, they're the thought, thought leaders at Solutions A. So these are the people who the, the specialists and the client managers um, come to when they have questions. They help drive the strategy campaigns. They're the smartest of the smart. Um, if y'all don't mind me flattering you just a little bit. And so what we wanted to do is pull them all together. We're going to do this once a week. And we're going to talk about a topic that is um, hopefully uh, high value. We want little hinge that swings the big door to steal from my buddy, Ralph. And so we want to accomplish three things. We want to serve our customers, obviously, serve our subscribers, but then also serve our internal team because getting alignment is hard. It's, it's really hard. It's so hard, in fact, that I've seen other agencies choose not to pursue what they know is best because they can't get their employees there. Like that's, if you really start to think about it, that's terrifying a little bit. So we're going to try not to do that. And today we're going to talk about what is literally my least favorite topic of all time. Um, I hate it. I hate everything about it. I wish it didn't exist. I don't want to do it. And I don't like talking about it or being asked about it. Uh, which is why we made it the topic of this video, because I feel like a lot of other people feel that way. And it's creative, creative uh, specifically for Google ads. Um, using creative from other channels in Google ads, when to start, how to start, best practices, how to use it, creative for PMAX, but not just for PMAX. Like we just want to talk about the, the creative endeavor within Google, what we've seen works, um, what we've seen doesn't work. And then also, this is the other thing that I'm going to ask my strategists. We're not here to posture. So we're not here to sell solutions aid. It's not a, we're not, you know, the experts or the thought leaders. We're a bunch of people in a sandbox learning. So it's okay not to know. So I just want to give everybody permission from Ooh. now until forever. Like we're just having a conversation and, and you know what I like more than being right. I like being wrong and then referencing it back. So like, if you say something that we find out three, six, nine months later, isn't the truth. What's nice about that is that's such a heavy dose of integrity that now our subscriber base knows like, okay, these people are really, they're figuring it out. And I've said, everybody knows, cause y'all have watched some of my videos. I've said some of the dumbest stuff on this channel and i've made like just some massive mistakes and fa shaking his head right now because he's like no you have no idea but but at the same time we're like we're we're making the mistakes so that people don't have to um and because we have access to 200 accounts and you know 54 million dollars in ad spend and under observation or management we get to see a lot of stuff so some of this we just have the privilege of access um and then the very last thing I'll say before I stop monopolizing the conversation is one of the things that we kind of suck at at Solutions 8 is, is arming our clients with what they need to provide us with for creative. Because we chose early, like, hey, we're a data-driven agency. We're not a creative agency. You bring the creative. And then clients would say, great, what do we bring? And we would say, you know, we're not so sure. We don't know. And it's, it's, it's hard to have like the SOP, the template, because every business is different. Every industry is different. Every service is different. Um, and so maybe this is the very first step towards something like that, uh, you know, kind of a productized offering as far as at least the ask is concerned. And I think, Usama, I want to start with you because I asked for this in Slack. I, I said, hey, y'all, what's the, what's the creative template that we would ask clients for? And you're the, the first and actually the only person, shame on everybody else, to give me something that, actually, that looked real, that looked like, okay, I could put this in front of a client and not be wildly ashamed. And so I'm going to read this off and then maybe we'll talk about it a little bit. Is that okay? Yeah. Cool. So Sama said we need, uh, for images, we need five with white backgrounds. These are product-based, I'm assuming. So I need to be able to showcase the product in basically any manifestation. Five lifestyle images, which John calls action shots. So somebody using the thing. Uh, and then you say five products in use. So help me there. What's the difference between a lifestyle image and a product in use image? So product, if like, let's say you're selling a chainsaw, a product in use would be someone cutting the tree and you're like, I got, got a close up. A uh, lifestyle would be someone just holding it in front of them and carrying it or something just to kind of visualize what it looks like from a distance kind of thing. Dude, why do you go for chainsaw? Like there are so many, how about Windex? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you were like Windex is like, chainsaw sounds cooler. Windex, you're like sitting, standing there like it this. Just so dark something to me. wasn't just... in your hand. <laughs> This Ready is why I go. thought you were older than you are. That's um, <laughs> never make a summer mess. <laughs> All right, so we need five uh, products with white backgrounds, five lifestyle images, and then five products in use. That makes a lot of sense, by the way. The lifestyle and the products in use, and you could see why for PMAX specifically, which is going full funnel, this would be really important. 
Uh, and then for videos, you said we need two product or service reviews, two product and use videos, and then one display product video. Any context you want to add there to any of those? Oh, wait, we've lost you, buddy. On mute. Back. Okay. Like I, I said, these reviews. are the smartest people that work at Solutions 8. Can't figure out if we're muted or not. Genius is over here. <laughs> Uh, okay, back to it. Um, for review videos, it's just good because if people, if you want to build trust, people need to know how your product works. And the best way to do that is not you selling it, but someone else selling it and telling someone mm -hmm. how it works or how well it works. So review videos are really good. Because I'm taking notes on something. No, then, you know what I'm doing is I'm writing down. Um, well, I was going to do it later, but I'll just do it now since you called me out. Um, Ian Garlic, do y'all know Ian? Video case story? Yeah. So Ian's our buddy. We're referral partners back and forth, he and I, and he made four or five videos for us. They're, they're, they're case story videos. So like he hunted down our, our customers, scheduled yeah. an interview with him, interviewed him, got him to give us like really great testimonials. Um, mm -hmm. And they walked them through the whole process. Like it's truly a story that they're telling. Um, yeah. And we've been using those for our remarketing and it's unbelievably powerful. I'm trying to, we, we just posted one recently, didn't we? Oh yeah, here it is. How well, else do Windows grew their business by 350%? Uh, we're yeah. also running remarketing ads with some of our review videos, which are absolutely killing it. Yeah, they perform better. One of them has like 50,000 views or something. It, it yep. did really, really well. So yep. totally second the product uh, reviews. Mm -hmm. And then for anybody watching, go check out Ian, video case story. We're not like direct affiliates or anything. So I'm not pushing him for that reason, but he does make videos for us. And then he sends us uh, uh, work sometimes if somebody wants ad management um cool how does that feel about the videos we only will touch the first one reviews. product service review so then we need two product and use product and use videos are just just like general people using the product i'm going to use a chainsaw example again show someone cutting down a tree show someone cutting some wood or like using it in their workshop or something like that anywhere you can show someone using the product in different environments that's good Right. Mm. You want to show it in different cases it being used because you want to kind of connect with your customer on that. And the last one is like display product videos. And the best example I can think of it is when Apple launches an iPhone, the different angles they get, it make they make it look super cool. And just like, what the heck even is this kind of thing? Right. Something like that. Yeah, dude, they truly are the gold standard when it comes to anything marketing based. It's unreal what they do. Yep. Um, the way that they the way that they articulate their value. I'm not gonna say this right because I'm not good at what it is and I'm trying to say, but Apple verbalizes value in the smallest number of words with the most impact. So like, if you go anywhere on their site, there's no paragraphs ever. It's always like, oh, yeah. you know, three words at absolute most, but you read it and you're like, dear God, that, that's exactly what this is. And if I, if I had to try to do that, it would be, you know, it'd be, I'd be writing Moby Dick by the time I was done. Um, I have a question about the videos. You said your product in use in multiple manifestations. Do you want your product in use by multiple avatars? Yeah, show different people using it. You don't want just, I don't want to be racist, but you don't want just one person using it and then only have one person in the whole video in different locations. Show like different people using well, it. So like the chainsaw, you could have a, a lumberjack, right? Or you yeah. could have a, a landscaper or you could have yeah. a horror movie director. I don't know just who like, uses chainsaw. Or just a dad in his workshop trying to cut down there something. There you go. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to open this up just a little bit. As far as the images and the videos that we've talked about, would anybody add anything to this template we're building? Let's actually, y'all want to do that? That's the goal of this video. Let's build the template now. I think that sounds fun. People can watch us do it live. Well, you know what I mean. Okay, I can add something like, uh, first, I got a question. Are we talking about e-commerce only or? Is no, I want, so I think we could split it up if you wanted to, but I'd like to build a template for all of our clients and we can say, here's for e-com, here's for lead gen. For lead I'm gonna generation. add you guys to this Google doc that I'm playing with, by the way, so everybody has it. Okay, for lead generation clients, I always give uh, monday.com as an example. If you ran into their ads, they are very effective. The reason is, you know, people have the option to skip your ad after like six seconds. In six seconds, monday.com says like it starts off with a guy 
pushing away from his desk and just complaining about, hey, I cannot work like this. Then somebody comes in and introduces the product, uh, says the brand name, then shows off the uh, product itself. So in six, six seconds, even though you skip, uh, you know what it is for, you know what problem it solves, you know how it solves, and you know the brand name. So I think you have to uh, use that in your advantage in six seconds. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Hold on, no, that was really brilliant. So I'm gonna put that under videos. I'm gonna say attributes. So within six seconds, we need to establish who it's for, what problem it solves. What was the other one? The brand name. Dude, so that, the brand name piece, that's such an important point because with everything Google from DSA to PMAC to smart shopping, which is going away and small companies don't wrap their head around this very well. You're building a brand. Yeah. People, people don't your care URL. about well, yeah. Look at Trivago. Is there anybody who don't know who Trivago is? Right. Hotels? Trivago. Can you say YouTube doesn't work? <laughs> Yeah. Well, and you know, I call it the Geico effect. Geico's done such a freaking unreal job at like carpet bombing the ecosystem with their, with their ads. You don't need to see Geico's ad to immediately know 15 minutes. I'll say 50%. You know what I mean? Like it's, 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 we're all Pavlovian trained neuroassociative conditioning. Like they've really embedded it into us and small companies have the ability to do that because even though you have a small audience and you're in a small company, the small spend, that small audience could see your ad hundreds if not thousands of times so get your brand name in there and then i want to add something to what you're saying fa which is uh, what molly Pittman calls the ad scent um and the ad scent is and we've only recently got good at this but you're using the same colors generally speaking the same theme the same fonts the same format and it doesn't need to be really advanced as a matter of fact it's way better if it's simple if it's super super simple and everybody knows like oh it has that yellow slash in the bottom right hand corner with the eight that's a solution date video um, so I'm going to say maintain ad set. Anybody want to fight me on that? No, I like that because you're building a, re a reputation around colors, fonts, for people to recognize immediately after when they see you or something close to it. Already. I think big all the big, big brands do this. So like in India, we have Swiggy and Zomato. If you look at their app icon color, if you look at the website, if you look uh, and if you check their ads, all of them are colored or they use col the same color. So mm -hmm. their app color is orange. So everything is orange. Uh, then if you look at their ads, their font size uh, or their font color, everything is in orange. So if someone uh, hear Swiggy, then they immediately connect Swiggy to that color, which is orange. Yeah, and uh, for Zomato, it's red. So I, I think that plays a, uh, important part when your company is big. I, I don't think it matters if you are a SMB, but if you are a med, medium level or uh, if you are a big company, then, then that matters. But I, I don't think it matters for a small business. Uh, so you, you said one thing I agree with and one thing I disagree with. The thing you said that I, I loved, Ankar, by the way, is, is the mm -hmm. icons. So like people will go all the way down to the favicon level. So you're looking at your yep. tab and your computer and you can tell mm -hmm. in the favicon, I know exactly who that brand is. And, and I, but I think I disagree with you about it not mattering for small business. I know what you're saying for big business, it matters way more, hmm. but, but yep. the reason it matters way more is because big businesses get so much more visibility. Well, we're now in an ecosystem where a small business can get that same amount of visibility with a really small audience. And so I think small businesses should think about establishing Dude, I really, really love that. That's something that every business needs is, can your, is your favicon re recognizable? Which, how big is a favicon, y'all? Is it like 20 pixels by 20 pixels or something? 120 by 120. I obviously don't know how big a pixel is. Again, it's small. Uh, 16 pixels by 16 pixels. Optimal size for a favicon. Okay. So yeah. do you have a recognizable favicon? And if not, that's a, that's a really good place to start because now you get to make sure that your ad scent is easier to, I see this a lot with realtors. Realtors have these great big ugly logos that include the entire name of their, their, their realty and their brokerage and their name uh -huh. under, and it's like, that's not a logo. That's like a, that's a work of art. You know, like what you have here is a painting and we need a, we need a favicon. Um, 
So that's a really good point, Ankar. I appreciate that. I'm going to share my screen real quick just so we can all see what I'm staring at. Because I want to build, if we're building a template here. So uh, we've got our images, five with white backgrounds. And I guess this is just for e-com, right? Yeah. And we can split this up later. Um, five lifestyle images, pro five products in use. What if you, what if you are lead gen? Lifestyle image is still applicable, I guess. I guess it, yeah, it'd still be applicable. It, it'll vary from service to service, but yeah, yeah. it'd still be pretty applicable. Yeah, it's been it's been tough with like service based like agency type clients. Um, the the really good display ads that I've seen usually usually that that agency will have gone out hired a graphic designer to come up with some you know cartoon type images that can be consistent. Like we have on our our website, solate.com mm -hmm. has little cartoons. That's the that that's probably the most effective because if you just use basic stock images, everyone knows it's just a stock image um and if you use you know if you use like little cartoon images that are consistent in all of your branding that style of cartoon with the with the colored backgrounds um people see it as more of a professional agency that has like graphic designers on hand i think well and to the point that Ankar is making that image ends up being part of your brand it's like as mm -hmm. consistent as your favicon or anything else um going back and picking on geico remember their cavemen like you could see the cavemen and then not even you don't have to see geico's logo because they've sort of extended their branding out um wait geico cavemen yeah wasn't it the guy it's so easy a caveman can do it i know there were cavemen commercials but i'm always thinking geico the gecko was he around the cavemen? So they've got, yeah, it was. The Geico was the, the caveman, the gecko. And then they had another one that was mildly quintessential. And they were all targeted at different demos. That, that's what was really smart about them. <laughs> you know what I think is kind of nefarious about Geico is they were the government's insurance agency. Y'all know that, right? That's what Geico, like it's an abbreviation for what does Geico mean? How do you insure a government? No, it was for government employees. Government employee insurance company. <laughs> uh, and then they, they're they like, we're making so much money. We should start selling this to people. I was on their remarketing ads for the past like six months. I am so sick of that stupid gecko. Sorry, Geico. Yeah. But I am. Please but stop. But it sort of that. speaks to like them having accomplished the goal. Um, <clears throat> and then I think you actually can bring it too far. That's a conversation for another day. So Smitha, you've been too quiet. What do you think about images and videos? Anything you'd add? Okay, so when it comes to images and videos, Kasim, like what I feel, like what we are using it, you know, what we should have, but also we should talk about what we should not have. Like, uh, mm. so we have something health related or supplements related uh, things, uh, clients, right? So, uh, you know, wherever we see that uh, some images that are revealing, like the body parts revealing, those are not acceptable. So, you know, we should also tell client like not to create such images because Google doesn't like it. Yeah. And that's, that's anything point. zoomed in, right? Like if you zoom in yeah. on a foot, yeah. Google doesn't like it. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's great to know. And the thing that sucks about Google's compliance requirements is there's nowhere you can go to see like, oh, here are our specific compliance requirements. It's always just kind of like, we sort of don't like things in these broad categories and best of luck to you in navigating mm -hmm. this, this ecosystem. Sure. All right. So we've got our images and videos more or less. Um, as Sama mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to move on to text unless y'all have more that you want to, this is the problem. It's so hard to know how, like, for instance, yeah. how long should the videos be? Or Ankar, what were you going to say? Yeah. So, uh, we always struggle, uh, in creatives, right? Uh, so if a client, if we say uh, that we, we need like 10 images, 15 images, and we need uh, five videos from you, then the client asks us how, uh, in which size you want, how uh, you want to be the creative, uh, like what should be the design and everything, right? So, and, and we are not graphic designers, so we can't tell them that we need uh, this icon here, uh, like this text here and, and we need a female or a male in the background. So the best thing we can do is we can copy or we, we can take inspiration from our computers. Mm -hmm. So the best tool to use, uh, like to check 
the creatives or videos uh, of competitors is SCM Rush. I, I think SCM Rush gives that data, yes, right? Yes, yes, So in true. SCM Rush, you can just put the competitor URL and it will give you all the data, like all the videos and display ads. Uh, uh, and, and you can check for how long the ad is running. So let's say if the image uh, is running for last 300 days, that means that image or that video is working for them, right? So we can take inspiration. We can, we should not copy that, but we can take inspiration from that and we can design our own images or videos. So uh, I think I think we can build an SOP or, or we can standardize it, but uh, we have to use like softwares or tools like this mm. uh, to, to find out what designs are what, let's say, uh, we are a small business and, and we want to compete with uh, a big, big company. So we can just put their name in our competitor, uh, sorry, in SEM Rush and we can find out what videos and images they are using. And we can take inspiration. We can create like good videos and images than them. And, and we can be better at free marketing or be better at uh, showing ads to cold audience. No, man, that's brilliant. I especially like what you said about looking at the elapsed time, because mm -hmm. especially for, for large organizations, but I guess this is true for all organizations, like money's not stupid. That's, and I, I think that's a, a generally ubiquitous truth. And if somebody is continuing to put money behind an ad, it means that ad is performing. And so if you've seen that this ad performs over a protracted period, especially if you can see common denominators among multiple competitors, and I've seen this in other industries too. You see this in skincare. Who are the proactive? You remember uh, the proactive guys? Um, they're still around, but they, they made, I, I think they're a $400 million company. Um, I think Dan Kennedy did all their copy, but proactive does the exact same. They do this, this pyramid image of the primary product and then all the secondary products kind of lined up behind it. And since proactive came out and did that, Every single subsequent competitor did this, this exact same. It looks like, um, it looks like a, an Olympic podium. And it just became this gold standard. And part of me is like, well, gosh, if you've got a skincare line, we know that this works because there's been you know, $400 million worth of advertising put behind it. Uh, Ankar, can you send me a link on how to, do you have to be a member of SCM Rush in order to do that? Yeah, uh, I think it's like, it's expensive. Can I so add it's something? A paid tool. It's a paid tool. It's like, it is yeah. a paid tool. Yeah, it's a paid tool, but so really we have like we have a trick. Uh, you can buy it for cheaper. Uh, I I I don't think so. Uh, we are allowed to say it. Here, <laughs> but... Solutions A do not condone any piracy. <laughs> <in the CMR. laughs> Regina, you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, I had a question for Usama about the uh, the five images, five, five, and five. Um, how do you handle like aspect ratio? Would you hope that those images, you know, are horizontal to two to one, and then you can chop them into square? No, I if I, if yeah. I had the opportunity, it'd be a unique image every single time. I don't want two of the same images, just different aspect ratios. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Before I forget, can I add something to Onkar's? Uh, no, yeah. not topic. allowed. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I know SCM Rush is, uh, you need to pay it, but it's not the same thing, but you can use Facebook ads library also. If you That's have what no I use. I was going to bring that up too. That's a really good point. If I keep going, sorry. But that was the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's what I was saying. I do the exact same thing, but I do it inside of Facebook ads library. And just like if I'm trying to build a, a napkin plan and I'll share and we can walk through this. Somebody give me an industry. Like, what's an industry where we'd want to go create uh, uh, an ad campaign for? Women's clothing. Women's clothing, you said? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Except his favorite niche, and he never gets those clients. That's so funny. That's so funny. Um, so, like, right out of the gate, we just get these phenomenal. Now, I'm going to say something before. You have before to go we... to the bottom. Like, you have to. Yeah, you have to get it. it. You have to go to the bottom. That shows you the longer running ad. Um, here's something that I learned. I think I learned it at TNC one year, and I wish I could remember who said it because I would I, I quote this so often that they they deserve proper attribution. But they said that there was like 
I don't know how many millions of, of ads tested against each other. And the highest performing avatar across all of them and all cultures was a 30 year old female Caucasian brunette who's attractive, smiling and making eye contact. And I heard that and I was like, you know, sort of just log that away. And, and, you know, I think I wrote it down at the time, but what's funny about it is now that I traverse throughout like my marketing world, everything I see, I'm like, oh my God, this is 80% of the people that were using in ads. So now that I've said that, I'm going to scroll through and it's unfair because we're doing women's clothing. So it's already kind of geared in that direction. Um, but you'll notice that it ends up being more or less true. So what is it that you'd be looking for here, F.A.? <laughs> this is awesome. something like that right there. <laughs> yeah. We recommend all of our clients to do something like Rambo Trump. I wouldn't go uh, for women's clothing. Uh, you have to type your competitor because even though women's clothing is one industry, you have like different options like Louis Vuitton and Zara are not competitors. So you have to niche down. Like, who do you sell? What do you sell? I typed in so Spanish. It's a link proposition. Like, is it the fabric? Is it the quality? Is it the brand? Like, mm. Dude, that's such a good point too. This is why creating an SOP for creative is so freaking hard because yeah. it's, well, what's your USP? If your USP is the material, then your creative should be on the texture of the material. If your USP is fair trade, then your, your creative should be about like the trade. If your USP is fulfillment, then your creative is about the fulfillment. And so it's, it just makes it, and I know this video is going to get really cyclical really quickly, but I think that's okay. I think it's okay for people to see us puzzling this out because then when we tell them after the fact, like, hey, we're really sorry, we don't know how to give you the creative, it's because, well, there's too many variables. Who are your competitors? What's working for them? What's your unique selling proposition? What is it that you want to highlight? Um, there's no real a, gold standard for it. You can yeah. find the utopia, but then you have to, like, you say you have to do this, this, this. It has to look like this, this, and this. Then the client says, okay, I'm going to spend $10 a day for this FA. Let's not. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No joke. So that's actually a really good point. Either a, they're like, Hey, wait a minute, slow down. We're not going to spend all this time, effort and energy or, and this is the part that scares me more than anything. We tell them here's exactly what we need and they give it to us and then it doesn't work. And now they get to hang us out on the ledge and say, you told me that this is what we needed. And, and really the truth is, is this is a, this is a, a creative endeavor where we're seeing what works against your market. So let's, I want to, everybody stop me just, hit eject if this is horrible but what if we flip the game board here a little bit and we decided what's the creative ask for new exploratory clients to help us understand what their creative should be as we've as we've established a proof of concept it's, it's honestly exactly what you said before it literally has to be around your usp all the stuff we said has to be built around your USP, like whatever your USP is, your images, your videos, the stuff people are talking about in your videos, what you want to portray in your images have to be around your unique selling point. If it's not, then I don't know why you're sending traffic to your website. Dude, that's a good end. So man, so we're getting better at pushing these folks away, but I can't tell you how many prospects we have come to us that have no USP. Like it's, oh, I sell shoes and it's well, why are your shoes better than other people's and i've you know i swear to god i've had people that are like they're really not they're more expensive <laughs> and they don't last as long and i'm like well what am i gonna do for you dude like <laughs> in what world do you think somebody's gonna buy this damn thing um so i like this we're gonna build we're gonna build a rules engine so we're not gonna build an ask sheet we're gonna build a rules engine so all creative should be built around your unique selling propositions i want to go back to what Ankar said uh build creative around what has worked for your competitors consistently. And then I'm gonna to go to what F.A. said, which was uh, build creative around as niche a competitive target as you can find. Go. And then what Susmita said, which was check creative against Google's compliance requirements. And Regina, I feel like I'm leaving you out, but I don't mean to. You have your hand up. This is good. I just raised it uh, for the unique or niche for the niche one. I just want to I want to put like a, a but on that. Um, so I work with really small budget clients and um, we can't go super niche because when we do, it tends to divide the budget up amongst a ton of different ton of different creatives. So what we've started to do is, you know, for example, if we're, we're working with an e-commerce client, 
we'll look at the website and we'll try to pick like three categories. Even if there's like 15 categories, we'll try to create three that encompass all 15, if that makes sense. As the business grows and scales, we can start to become more granular. Maybe we'll make a fourth category that that includes, you know, two of the 15 categories and pull them out. Mm. So, you know, create creatives that we would ask for would be based off of that. Um, and so it's, it's hard sometimes to ask upfront in the onboarding, um, you know, in the onboarding process, because we don't have that strategy just yet. What we'll ask for is, hey, if you have any existing images, please send them over as a starting place. Then we'll come up with kind of the, the structural strategy. If we're working with Pmax, for example, that's even more relevant than if we're just doing display where we, we can, um, decide the budget and then you know and then we'll go back to the client and say hey we would love some lifestyle images about this as a category you know um because but yeah, a lot of times is, pmx will inform the creative creation because we'll find an audience that we want to target and now we want an asset against that audience yeah with small budgets custom lately we've stopped even doing audiences really because we can't afford yeah. You can't, we can't afford, afford to it. divide by audience. So we have to divide by categories. We can only make like three asset groups. So it's like product category, product category, product category, done. Let's assume for the sake of this exercise that we're talking about adequate budgets so that we can give people the rules as they should exist. And then we can have the exceptions. Is that, a, is that an unfair? Yeah. And, and what I was imagining would be nice is to have a couple of SOPs yeah. With like ranges, you know, this many images for this budget, this many images for this budget. Exactly, um, we should have. Yeah, so it would be decision tree, lead gen, e com, move mm -hmm. down, budget, more or less, move down, market size, or you know, that might actually precede budget. Um, yeah. But I like, I like the decision tree better than I like the wish list for so many reasons. Um, I'm going to repeat what we've got. All of your creative should be built around your USP. And that's the thing, right? Like that's the thing that will make or break any campaign. Is, yeah, is you have to implement why people should click on that. You have you you have to have a hook, okay? Yeah. This is not Facebook ads. Like Facebook ads creators are completely different because once I am in Instagram, uh, for a brief moment, your ad will be, will be the only thing I'll see. Okay, it will take up whole of my screen. But with Google, let's say it's a display ad. So this is my screen and. I'm reading news, your ad will be here. So right. you have to grab my attention. It has to be different. It has to be your unique selling proposition. Why should I click on it? Why should I stop reading my news, which is important, which is I came to decide for, and why should I move on to a, to a purchase decision? F.A., you just blew my mind a little bit. Here's what's really interesting about, <laughs> this gets more philosophical than anybody would want to get for this video, but this is worthy of another video. Facebook, I've always called Facebook interrupter marketing. I'm not the only one. Other people call Facebook interrupter marketing because you're scrolling through your newsfeed and then it interrupts. YouTube in stream is interrupter marketing too. But what you're referring to isn't really interrupter marketing because we don't even have the luxury of interrupting. Yep. It's like, what would we call it? Like distractor marketing. You know, it's like, hey, there's this something that's, you know, shiny object marketing. Like if you can capture their attention, because when you have the luxury of interrupting, you actually have an at bat. You're given a, a microsecond or a six second, depending on what it is, opportunity to swing, right? You actually get to swing at this ball. But for distractor marketing, you're one step removed from the swing and you have to get them, you have to really capture their attention. That's a, that, that implication there is huge, man. That's really well said. Yeah. And also one more thing for lead, uh, this, this is for lead generation. Uh, you have to focus on who to push instead of pulling, right? So mm. uh, let me explain this a little. So display marketing, you are pulling people, right? So click on this, I'm selling this, I, I'm the right choice for you. But let's say we have a client, uh, their private gym, it's not private uh, trainer, it's not your regular gym, it's a really expensive private gym. You have five people with you in that gym at the time. So if you try to pull everybody, say, uh, 28 days guaranteed, uh, you will look like this by the end of the training. Uh, you will have people that are looking at a gym for like 50 bucks and you are charging $500. So you have to push those people. So you have to be careful with that too. For lead generation. Mm. Your, your creative should attract and repel. Yeah.
that's really good yeah but i think like here uh testing is like we can't test actually uh the images like what is working what is not in google ads it's so specific frustrating. in pmax yeah it's so in, in facebook it's but different you because you can to be able to groups. like don't you think that data is coming it has to right there's too much overlap between the asset groups it's impossible mm. to tell what's working where yeah because here like in facebook and instagram there are only display ads right mm. but in here we have seven channels and most of the conversions are coming from search and shopping so you can't say that the creative worked because we were uh, sorry you can't say that the asset group or the audience seeking work because we use this image or or that video like it's not dependent yeah, on that you just know video. yeah so what's <laughs> it's, the it's difficult i mean you, we would start to get a sense over time mm -hmm. and i guess over multiple asset groups because you would find common denominators but it would take a lot of time yep and a lot of consistency um and you're right, Google doesn't let us view any dimension-based data when it comes to creative at all, which is mm. nuts. Can you, Unkar, you're the one that figured out the reporting where we could see landing pages. I wonder if in the reports, there's like a nested creative. Yeah, we, we can, no. But uh, to see data, we have to send traffic to a specific landing page or a different right. landing page. Then we can uh, see that, that landing page or that creative world yeah and if we wanted to see the creative performance <laughs> in the asset group we'd actually sacrifice the the machine learning endeavor because you'd have to have all the same creative so mm. now the goal of the campaign became split testing creative not the performance of the campaign I, honestly man that's just something we're gonna have to live with and i mean us i mean the world is gonna have to live with google's not giving us it's going to be end result, cash in, cash out. It's what we're telling people about a lot of things. Um, so here's what I think. I think we developed five golden rules of creative for Google ads. All of your creative should be built around your unique selling proposition. Build creative around what has worked for your competitors consistently. Build creative around as niche a competitive target as possible. And I'm going to remove the word competitive because this is true for your competitors, but it's also true for your customers. Build creative around as niche a target as possible. And I, I want, might say, Regina, to your point, where budget allows. Uh, check creative against Google compliance requirements. And your creative should attract and repel. Attract the right audience and repel the wrong audience. Those are really good rules, y'all. Like, this was a really productive little video that we, this could have been really embarrassing. We could have shot this whole damn thing and ended up with literally nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> So this is a, a, an experiment. Is there anything that we'd add to this? We've got a couple of minutes left. Like anything, I don't want to add for the sake of adding. And I like five golden rules. That feels really good. But if there's other- I think those are solid. Yeah, I do too. If you, go, if you put too much, people are going to be, it's, it'll just get excessive. Yeah. Five is a good number. All right. So we'll say like subject to imp improvement as we learn more and as the world learns more. Subject to change. Yeah, as are all things. And what's funny too, and what scares me, but also excites me is people are going to see like just what a train wreck we really are because this is how we figure stuff out. You know what I mean? You'd think like the number one Google ads agency, like we have an R&D department and they go and they do an impact report and we, we have like hundreds of millions. Of, it's like, no, we just put a bunch of people on a Zoom call and we're like, y'all, how do we, how do we fix this? This is a problem. How do we fix it? Yeah, but, but. Then we go test it and we bring back data. So that's the part that they won't see, I guess, to, to our defense. Like it's always test it, prove with data, test, prove with data. And then John usually comes in and outruns all of us, the bastard. Um, it could be six of us and John and would still lose. Swear to God. Yeah, that guy. No he's, the golden, he's the golden goose. Um, we need to protect him at all costs. Y'all realize that, right? Mm. Like he, he shouldn't have cholesterol. He needs to drink more water. He has to start going for walks. <laughs> all right this is awesome hey, look and if you're watching uh we want to hear from you and i really mean this by the way i say this in some videos and then nothing happens what do you want from us what do you want i mean we're gonna not stop shooting these videos so you guide the process what are topics you'd like to hear about things that you think we skip over what do you disagree with what did we say here today where you're like our oh, costume's an idiot because whatever what what would you add to it we have our five golden rules of creative right now is there anything that you think that we that we missed out on uh we want this to be a conversation we want it to be synergistic um 
And we want to be the, the number one YouTube channel on the freaking planet. And right now, I think we're, we're just about to surpass 10,000 subscribers, which is pretty cool. But like my buddy was there, has 20,000. What the hell? So, you know, I don't know how he's outpacing us, but he is. God bless him. So I want to go steal all his subscribers. And um, who's the other guy? We, we need to start running ads on his channel. That's Dude, he runs ads on our channel. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Well, he, he is the reason, like, the channel exists, too. So I guess we'll give him. There's a Surfside PPC. Is that the guy? The he is UK one? Back. Yeah, yeah. He's got 100,000 yeah, yeah. subscribers. Yep. Yeah. So I want, I want all those subscribers. Um, I don't know why we don't have those yet. Let me go see if I just made that up. Surfside PPC, 175,000 subscribers. Dear God. And dude, he posts like a couple of times a month. It's really good content. You should, everybody should go subscribe if you haven't heard of him. He's a good dude. I'm sure. I don't know him, but he has good content, but he doesn't post as much as we do. So anyway, I'm rambling now. Um, this is good. Daily Google News. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you tomorrow. Wait, before you go, I'm constantly looking for amazing people to come join our team. So if you're passionate about Google Ads and you're passionate about customer success, please go to solate.com forward slash apply. And we'd love to see you as a part of the Solutions 8 team. Also, if you like this video, give us a thumbs up. It lets the YouTube algorithm know that we actually know what we're doing. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. We shoot a video every single day. And I don't want you to miss out on any of it. Lastly, if you have questions, comments, concerns, confessions, or you just hate my face and my voice, go ahead and hit us up in the comments. We get very little human interaction, and even the heckling is something that I kind of get a kick out. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being subscribers if you're a subscriber. Don't forget to apply if you're interested in working at Solutions 8. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow.